When it comes to the biggest and most memorable wrestling icons, Rowdy Roddy Piper is often near or at the top of everyone's list. Over the years, I've talked plenty about Piper, and I've used enough superlatives to the point where I'm kind of running out of things to say. His career in the World Wrestling Federation was legendary as one of the biggest foils to megastar Hulk Hogan before turning into one of its most popular wrestlers. Having several on and off runs there from his retirement match at WrestleMania 3 until his sudden passing five years ago, the Hot Rod did just about all there was to do in that company, which allowed him plenty of time to pursue his acting career. Who could forget such classics as They Live, Hell Comes to Frogtown, Back in Action, Immortal Combat and Jungle Ground. But in 1996, WCW needed a hero. Hollywood Hogan and his New World Order were running roughshod over the company in the midst of their hostile takeover. Having already taken care of rivals like Ric Flair, The Giant, and Randy Savage, Hogan convinced Executive Vice President Eric Bischoff to recruit perhaps his biggest rival from the golden era not named Bobby Heenan. Thus began a multi-year run for the Hot Scott in World Championship Wrestling, a tenure marred with head-scratching booking decisions, all played out by a man with a quick wit, no script, and zero filter. So how did it all play out? Well, if you've watched these videos in the past, what do you expect? Let's look at Roddy Piper in WCW. Our story begins at Halloween Havoc 1996. Moments after Hollywood Hogan retained the WCW Championship against Randy Savage in the main event, the Hot Rod made a surprise appearance to confront the champion, not even two months removed from his final on-air appearance in the WWF. Piper took umbrage to Hogan's posturing, saying he was just as big an icon and movie star as Hogan was. Well, if you think about it, you know, both statements are kind of true, just maybe don't bring up the movie part so much. Roddy lit into Hogan by making fun of his bass guitar playing and his hair loss before really twisting the dagger and saying Hogan had never defeated him, which isn't exactly true, but don't let facts get in the way of a good story. Though they went over their time as the show faded to black and Piper was still yelling, the impact had been made. Roddy Piper was back and he wanted a piece of the Hulkster once again. Piper wouldn't be seen on TV again for weeks after his debut, but his next appearance would prove historical in its own right. The November 18th edition of Nitro ended with Eric Bischoff in the ring, saying he'd been trying unsuccessfully to get Piper to sign a match for Starcade. Piper himself showed up in the ring to confront Eric, and soon it was revealed in kind of a clunky manner that Easy e himself was the man in charge of the NWO. What'd you fly? First class coach, how'd you fly? First class coach, what was it? First class coach, how'd you fly? Sorry. When you come up to my ranch, tell me, is the road crooked or is the road straight? Tell me, is the road crooked? This guy here, now, he works for the NWO. I should have known that Eric was part of that group. Everyone knows he doesn't fly anywhere. He goes right on the back of a garbage truck. World War III was the site of the Starcade contract signing, but Piper wasn't taking any NWO guff. First of all, I taught you how to fight, so get out of my way. Yeah, and a great job you did too, what with Virgil winning most of his matches in 91 by accident. It was at this point in Piper's career that his promos went a little more off the deep end than normal, which is a pretty scary thought. Let's just say he decided to make his act a little more blue. You think that I'm going to trust a lion, little flake? Day. Oh, and trust me, there's a lot more of that during this run. And not once have I had my hair primped, and not once have I had my nails done. You and Eric Bischoff, what are you, married man? Is that what's going on? What are you in Frisco right now? You 5 of 30 in the morning looking drag queen? Well, the rest of the NWO are in spandex just jumping out of the closet. Now, him and Hogan, I don't know what. Are you ex-lovers? Is this what's going on? I reverse the decision the next day. What did you want me to do? Give you a gift from RuPaul? Is that what's going to make you happy? I want to do a beer. You no got problem. It? I got it. No problem. <laughs> it's just, um, yeah. Another curious thing about Piper's promos during this run was whenever he talked about his family, something seemed off about how large it actually was. It's time that I grew up and become a man. I got six kids at home. I got six kids. I don't need to call myself macho man. Wait a minute. I thought he had like four kids or something. Did he adopt Jason Jordan at some point and I missed it? Hogan then came out and dressed Piper down in front of everyone, figuratively and literally, as it was revealed that Piper was still recovering from hip replacement surgery. After a timely peg leg Pete reference and a steel chair beatdown, Piper was hopping mad leading up to the big main event at Starcade. While their match in Nashville may not have quite resembled what they did 10 years earlier, and certainly couldn't compare to what the undercard was doing that same night, there was at least a level of storytelling and emotion brought forth through their body language. And though the two were past their prime, this high-profile main event did help Starcade 96 earn the company's biggest buy rate up to that point. 
The scrappy Piper managed to beat Hogan in the middle of the ring by submission, the first time Hogan had ever lost in that manner. The fans came unglued after seeing the rowdy one finally vanquish the evil Hollywood Hogan, knocking the champ off his perch and finally claiming the world title he never got a chance to... <laughs> I'm kidding, I'm kidding. The title didn't change hands that night, cause that would be silly. Despite writing up the match contract himself according to storyline, it appears the Piper left out a teensy little detail about the whole world championship thing. The match was non title the entire way through, it was just never mentioned as such on air. Oh, I can't blame the fans for going nuts seeing Piper win here. For all intents and purposes, this felt like a title match, and why wouldn't it? Two all time greats battling it out at WCW's biggest show of the year. I mean, it was a hell of an upgrade from the main event two years earlier. If there was a time and a place for Roddy Piper to finally get the big win over Hogan, this was probably gonna be it. Not only does a bait and switch of this magnitude risk alienating the fan base, it also made Piper look like a real dummy. It's like buying a car and forgetting to get the wheels that come with it. How do you not get the belt on the line and make that sort of thing official? Later on Nitro, Piper would come out to the ring with his young son Colt, apparently ready to walk away from wrestling to spend time with his family. But after Hogan and Bischoff verbally humiliated him in front of his kid, enough was enough, and Piper vowed revenge. A rematch was set for Super Brawl with the title actually on the line this time. All Piper had to do was to heal up, condition his body and mind, keep focused, and I'm going to stay here for seven days and seven nights! Oh! On the Nitro before the pay-per-view, fans witnessed one of the strangest things WCW has ever produced. And considering they've also made Lost in Cleveland and White Castle of Fear, that's saying a lot. Here the hot Scott felt it necessary to lock himself into the infamous Alcatraz prison in the San Francisco Bay for a whole week. Because keeping yourself trapped in an empty prison is great preparation for wrestling, cause... You... I don't know. I'm coming into the Cobb Palace on the 23rd, dead inside. Hogan, Hogan, you listening to me? Hollywood Hogan here with your platinum blonde hair. And as the lady say, do do do, do do do, what you gonna do when I'm through with you, Mr. Spandex? But seriously, wouldn't it have been awesome to be part of one of those Alcatraz tour groups and you see this guy bouncing off the walls of a cell? All right, folks, uh, if you look to your left over here, this is the jail cell where Al Capone slept. Yeah, yeah. And uh, right here down the hall and around the corner, there's a small closet where they filmed a scene from the movie The Rock, starring uh, Nick Cage and Sean Connery. Huh? And uh, right over here, here's a jail cell. Uh, there's a professional wrestler in there getting ready for his match with Hulk Hogan. What's that? Uh, no, I have no idea who let him in either. So uh, we're walking, we're walking. Come on, single file line, everyone. <laughs> Need something extra. Perfect. Then at Super Brawl itself, there's this parting shot of Piper riding a boat back to the mainland, hanging off the front mast. According to an interview with producer Neil Pruitt, the ship captain warned Piper after the fact the old mast could very well have broken with him on it like that, sending him into the frigid waters below. You know what, um, as long as he were okay, like nothing bad happened to him when he fell, I would have liked to have seen that. The rematch at the Cow Palace was an old school brawl, but this time we'd see a different result from Starcade, as a newly turned Randy Savage helped Hogan out after Piper put him down with a sleeper. As I've talked about before in my Savage episode, this finish is absolute trash. Savage pulls Hogan under the ropes well after Brian Hildebrand dropped the arm three times and could clearly see Hogan's leg placement before the bell rang. But then he looks back and second guesses himself, forcing him to restart the match. It looks so bad, I almost get the feeling that Savage was supposed to be way sneakier about it, but everybody was just out of position so he just had to go for it afterward and hope for the best. So after looking real stupid after Starcade, now he and the ref both looked dumb as Hogan was able to pull out a sneaky win and retain the championship. In fairness, Piper's character has never really been known for his brilliant acumen. A few weeks after this embarrassing loss, Piper would come back as he continued to wage war against the NWO. Having rejected the offer by the Four Horsemen to join him at Uncensored, Hot Rod instead decided to hold an open audition to see who would join his family against Team WCW and Team NWO. The audition consisted of four really bad mini-matches in a row as Piper would fight four random dudes working various shoot styles, a kind of performance that was completely against the grain from what fans at the time had come to expect. Piper would defeat the likes of the future Luther Reigns and the future 
Dr. Golga in a segment that technically went around 20 minutes long, but felt more like 20 years. <laughs> You're telling me, man, this was so boring. I grew a full beard just watching it. God, why didn't dad tell me it would itch so much? Here's the kicker. The angle went over so badly they cut bait the very next week, with Piper publicly firing his motley crew and hooking up with the horsemen after all. What a fabulous waste of time that was. And oh yeah, Team NWO won that match at Uncensored too. Fast forward two months when Piper teamed with longtime friend Ric Flair and former NFL player Kevin Green to take on Scott Hall, Kevin Nash, and six of the NWO. But the drama between the two sides wasn't just playing out in kayfabe, but behind the scenes as well. Apparently, Hall had heat with Piper for refusing to put Hogan over clean at Super Brawl. The tension reached its apex in the build toward the Great American Bash when Piper and Flair challenged Hall and Nash for the Tag Team Championships. Who needs Vince Russo to inject reality into storylines when these guys were doing it years before he showed up? And it wasn't for us paving this smooth road. You might not be so damn cool. I looked down the road that you guys paid for us. I saw nothing but potholes. Scott Hall was ready to become a superstar. Hey, I was a little green. There wasn't no party, just punishment for the guys trying to dig the business out of the funk you guys left it in. Things fell apart on June 9th when a main event match on Nitro between the two sides ended several minutes early, forcing an awkward brawl at the end of the program. It led to an altercation backstage between Piper and Nash. And in a rare politically astute move by WCW, they decided to actually keep the two factions apart on air from that point instead of stoking the flames of backstage bitterness on the public stage. After a brief program with Flair at that year's Bash at the Beach, Roddy would take a couple more months off before coming back to TV in September in a role he was quite comfortable in, filling in for an injured J.J. J. Dillon as the interim commissioner of WCW. And as one of his first acts, Piper decided to book himself in that cage match with Hogan that he would have gotten had he won the uncensored match for Halloween Havoc. This is important for later. I mentioned earlier the two previous Piper Hogan matches were a little behind the times, but still packed with emotion, drama, and storyline intrigue. Well, this is where all that kind of fell off. My friends, I give you what came to be known as Age in the Cage. What went wrong on the match? Well, for starters, the bell rang. Fans had already seen this matchup twice before with disappointing endings, and needless to say, this style of wrestling ran up against the far more exciting fare the rest of the roster was able to provide. The men were allowed to leave the cage at will, kind of rendering it pointless, and to make matters worse, there was also tons of outside interference, including from Randy Savage, who I can't believe didn't break his leg after that massive drop. In the end, Piper would win the third and final encounter between he and Hogan in WCW, but much like at Starcade the previous year, the title was not on the line. Though it could be forgiven because it set up the much bigger title change two months later at Starcade, it sure looks like Piper outsmarted himself once again, being able to beat Hollywood but not walking out with a championship in a match that he himself had made. But the biggest problem was, this match was the second in three weeks to feature two guys in a big-ass cage. Does the first Hell in a Cell match ring any bells to people? Shawn Michaels and The Undertaker delivered an absolute classic at Bad Blood, which only served to highlight WCW's big problems at the top of the pyramid. Honestly, Jim Cornette's classic rant from this time period puts it better than I ever could. Despite the shortcomings of the main event, Halloween Havoc still brought in killer numbers, earning one of the highest buy rates of the year, second only to Starcade in December. Piper went away again following Havoc, but finally re-emerged in the spring of 98 as a consultant for WCW. So basically a third authority figure between J.J. Dillon and Eric Bischoff. Yes, that's what wrestling needed in 98. More of that. As a consultant, Piper made a sweeping declaration. No more bats in the WCW and now Nitros, no more bats at all. Ah, jeez. You know, everybody wants to talk about bat control, but sooner or later you're going to ask for things like, like chair control or, or kendo stick control or slop control. I mean, where's this going to end? With the NWO beginning to fragment, Piper interjected himself into the feud between the Giant and the team of Hogan and Nash, leading to a bat match at Spring Stampede, right after Piper said there'd be no more bats in WCW. After losing said bat match, thanks to help from the Disciple, no, no, the other disciple. Piper served as the guest referee for a match at Slamboree between Bret Hart and Randy Savage. Piper had originally given the win to Bret by submission, but then reversed it one night later after finding out that Hollywood Hogan played a hand in the finish. This didn't stop Savage from descending into paranoia, aka going full Savage, and alleging that somehow Piper and Bret, long rumored to be distant cousins, were working in cahoots. Okay, why does every babyface in WCW have to be a complete 
idiot. What conspiracy is there? Piper reversed the decision on Randy's behalf. But then again, with promos like this, I'm not surprised Savage is going a little cuckoo around this time. Your apology that you didn't give me for the mistake that you made was very, very weak. You call yourself an icon. I don't even know what that word means. Is that a bird? Anyway, the two agreed to fight against Hogan and Hart at the Great American Bash, then fight each other right afterward. In the tag team match, Bret would make Savage tap out with a sharpshooter. And while Piper didn't want to beat a guy when he was down, the Macho Man was too proud to back down, leading to an easy Piper victory in less than two minutes. The following night on Nitro, Piper commissioned his... Commissioned? Commissionered? his way into the referee spot for the main event between Savage and Diamond Dallas Page, a match that occurred when Mach took offense to Kevin Nash recruiting Page for the Wolfpack. I mean, if you're going to bring someone new into your group, you might want to ask your current members if any of them had a recent blood feud with the guy. The Hot Rod even upped the ante and made it a cage match, which of course meant it ended with an NWO beatdown that wrote both he and Savage off TV for months. Have I mentioned that Piper never came off as the smartest official in WCW? Piper returned in the fall to team with DDP and the Ultimate Warrior to represent WCW in an ill-fated War Games match at Fall Brawl 98, a match best known for everyone playing dead for several minutes while U-Dubs played with his fog machine. His final appearance in 98 was the very next night on Nitro when he took Bret Hart to task for his allegiance to Hulk Hogan before running off to his home in Beaverton for a few more months. But, but, is the road to get there crooked or straight? I have to know! Roderick made a surprise return to Nitro in February of 1999 to challenge Brett for the United States Championship, a match that was less about Roddy's return and eventual victory and more about Brett's ongoing feud with Mad TV's Will Sasso. You know, the important stuff. But Piper's third reign as U.S. champ and the first in nearly 16 years was uneventful, as he'd lose the title less than two weeks later to Scott Hall at that year's Super Brawl. And if you can believe it, that's probably the most logical Piper's booking was all year. At around this time, Ric Flair returned to WCW after having been banished by Eric Bischoff, then eventually beat Eric for the office of president of WCW. And because authority in wrestling is like the one ring, the nature boy immediately became drunk with power. Piper, using his authority as consultant or commissioner, whatever he was called that week, had Flair committed to an insane asylum. We'll be coming around the mouth and we come. We'll be coming around. Now, believe me, there's a lot I want to talk about when it comes to that angle, but come on, guys, have some patience. This is, after all, this is Roddy's story. Though institutionalized, Flair was still able to make a match between himself and Piper at Slambury for control of the company, about that ended with a returning babyface Eric Bischoff helping reverse the decision to allow Piper to win. Now stay with me folks, because this next sequence of events is so confusing it's going to make the corporate ministry higher power angle from that same year look like child's play. Flair and Piper met again at the Great American Bash, where Buff Bagwell, who had sided with Piper in recent weeks, attacked Flair in plain view of the ref and cost Piper the match, allowing Flair to regain his presidency. So offended was Piper at Buff's stupidity, Roddy turned heel and sided with Flair and company after having just wrestled him. But then again, if I had the choice between Buff Bagwell or Ric Flair as my partner, the choice wouldn't be that tough. Flair rewarded Piper for his sudden change of heart by making him the vice president, which, considering how close these two were behind the scenes, must have been pretty awesome to act out. Me, RPVP, right? But that's the main event. That's the main, main event. event fashion beach. Wait a second. Wait, wait. RPVP, right? I know you don't smoke, but if you were to get hit by a tobacco truck, would I become president? <laughs> At my age, I might fall over right now. You never know. <laughs> I got it. Let's do it. Great idea. I'm ah, on. RPVP. Great idea. Woo! You got it, buddy. I don't know why, but Piper just shouting the letters RPVP over and over again is one of my most lasting memories of WCW. I don't get it either. In an attempt to recreate the magic of his WrestleMania 2 encounter with Mr. T, Piper met Bagwell in a boxing match at Bash the Beach with Judge Mills Lane as the special guest referee. Now that's what you call a relevant celebrity cameo. The bout ended when Judy Bagwell put a bucket on Piper's head, allowing her son Buff to capitalize. You know, the more I think about it, the more I realize that Scott Hall's anger toward Piper for his backstage politics makes a lot of sense. Duly humiliated, Piper vanished again from television, only to return in November for the storyline that really is the ultimate capper to his entire WCW run. By this point, WCW was in full Russification mode as the powers that be, aka Russo yelling at wrestlers while off camera, were in firm control. The returning Piper went on a tirade against Russo's booking in an agonizing warped shoot, which led to the powers condemning him to work as a referee for the remainder of his contract. They write in TNA, they write in sex, you know why? They can't get any! They gotta write about it! 
This would lead to the second screw job esque finish Russo had booked in two years at Starcade 99. In the main event, Bret Hart and Goldberg had waged war over the world title, with a couple of referees and sadly some of Bret's brain cells being casualties in the contest. Out came the hot rod to help officiate the match, where he would ring the bell before Goldberg had tapped out at the sharpshooter, declaring Bret the winner and storming off without a word, the night ending not in satisfaction, but in confusion. Boy, for a show we keep referring to as WCW's biggest show of the year, they found a lot of ways to fuck it up. The following night on Nitro was built all around Piper, as Russo implied that he had made a deal with him, the details of which were never revealed. It was your idea from the get-go, and me? I had absolutely nothing to do with it. Piper was also accompanied throughout the episode with an actor playing his fake son, Mick. Maybe it was one of his extra kids. Over the course of the night, Piper delivered two scathing promos about Russo's booking both to the crowd and to the locker room before destroying the powers of Beast set with a baseball bat. That night's main event saw a world title rematch between Brett and Goldberg, only this time Brett got help from Hall, Nash, and Jeff Jarrett, forming the ill-advised NWO 2000. This horrific beatdown caused Roy to fall on top of Goldberg to save him from further attacks, only he jumped his cue and covered him way too early, forcing this hilarious finish. But look at Tiger, he's covering Goldberg's body with his own body! Roddy! Booby! How do you screw this up every time? Piper's final appearance in WCW was being a surprise referee for the world title match between Jarrett, Sid, and Scott Hall at Super Brawl in February 2000 before being fired as a cost-cutting measure that summer. No longer allowed to fulfill the 40 dates left on his contract, Piper would sue the company for age discrimination. Pretty ironic considering you could argue it was reverse age discrimination that allowed him to come to WCW in the first place. When he first arrived in WCW, Roddy Piper was kind of like an old gunslinger, a lone wolf wandering back into town for one last ride. But by the end, he was kind of like a crazy uncle who showed up drunk to dinner a few times a year. When he really had something to sink his teeth into, like that first feud with Hogan, Piper would give passionate and emotional performances that displayed a seasoned but more vulnerable man than what we known and loved in the 80s. But when the booking became nonsensical and the promotion began to circle the drain, we got the rambling Rod who perpetually questioned his opponent's sexuality or mental health. And for a guy who had a surprising amount of creative control over the course of his career, it's amazing just how often Roddy was portrayed like a complete fool, not just as a wrestler, but as an on-air authority figure as well. Since Piper had such a storied acting career, let's use fellow actor Robert De Niro as an analogy. For every taxi driver or raging bull, there's also Rocky and Bullwinkle and Dirty Grandpa. Like any great performer, sometimes it all boils down to the material you have to work with. And for better or for worse, Piper did what he could to make it work, as only Roddy Piper could. Be sure to thumbs up this video if you like it, comment below, subscribe to Wrestling With Regret, and buy the t-shirts at ProWrestlingTees.com. I'm Brian Zane, and I'll see you next time.